Hey guys, Whitney here. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. We are going to just take a couple minutes and let everybody file into the Zoom room and also get our guest of honor on here today. But uh, if this is your first time joining the show, my name is Whitney Elkins Hutton. I'm the Director of Investor Education here at PassiveInvesting.com. And I'm so excited to have you guys on here today. We do this show, the Passive Investing Made Simple show every Tuesday live. Um, so um, be sure to join Passive Investing with Whitney.com to get access and notifications of future shows. Also to join our boot camps, we will have a our, our September boot camp next Wednesday. It will be a recurring time. So don't quote me guys, we are gonna try to hold it the first Wednesday of every month or excuse me, the second Wednesday of every month at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, just so everybody can you know, get it in, fit it in over their lunch hour. But anyways, today I'm so excited to be joined by our Director of Investor Relations, Rob Gallo. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks, Whitney. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Well, Rob, uh, I, I think people got to meet you a little bit like back in July. They've also gotten to uh, meet you a little bit on our um, sister podcast, the Multifamily Investor Nation podcast. Yep. But for those that, people who just uh, joined the Passive Investing Made Simple podcast, tell them a little bit about yourself and how you got to be the Director of Investor Relations with PassiveInvesting.com and what your role is here. Got it. Absolutely. We'll start with, uh, as, as Whitney just pointed out, I'm the director of investor relations at PassiveInvesting.com. Um, I, I work with two incredible teams, not discounting Whitney because that's just at another level in terms of, of, of who I work with. Uh, but I work with our investor relations teams that does a lot of our outreach uh, in informing our investors about deals, as well as our investor services teams that really help get all the back end paperwork and everything done. Two teams that, you know, I, we would be nowhere without, uh, and they do, do such a great job in that perspective. Um, how I got here? Well, um, in my former career, I was actually a consultant uh, for a long time. And um, Danny Randazzo and I crossed paths multiple times in that uh, in that industry. Um, but during that time, kind of towards the, the back end after meeting Danny, I had been a, a an investor with him in a, in a few flips in the Charleston area. Uh, and one of the original like LPs that had started with PassiveInvesting.com. And I've just um, been doing that. I've also own, um, well, part owner, silent owner, I'll say, of uh, a couple um, Airbnbs in the New Buffalo area by Lake Michigan. Um, I live in the northern side of Chicago, so my sister and brother-in-law, uh, we have some fun uh, out there as as active investors. Um, and then in reality, kind of the the uh, the stars aligned uh, when um, PassiveInvesting.com was looking for a new investor uh, director, excuse me, investor relations director, and. I, I put my name in the hat because this is this is something I've wanted to do for for a very long time and just really had nev never had the opportunity. So I'm very very fortunate to be here. Had myself on mute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we are so fortunate to have you here, Rob. So um, you know he's been a wonderful addition to the team. And uh, guys, if you haven't had the opportunity to reach out to Rob um, or maybe meet him at one of our investor dinners, um, be sure you get the, the chance to, to meet him. Um, and, you know, our, our team has always been amazing, but yeah, I am just so excited to uh, of what, what's in store for us for the future. All right, so today we are talking about understanding the importance of due diligence. Okay, so... I, um, you know, we've talked about due diligence uh, quite a bit, uh, you know, in various forms uh, of, you know, lines of questioning, you know, um, like how to vet operators, how to vet markets, how to vet deals, but we didn't, we never really defined what due, dil due diligence is, why is it important? And it just, it really does go beyond just like operator market and deal. There's some like kind of nooks and crannies we got to mm -hmm. dig into here. So let's start off, like, I always like defining the topic. What does due diligence actually mean? So in, in my eyes, due diligence is really the process of, of conducting your research and in analyzing any real estate opportunity that comes to you. Because specifically when we're talking about passive investors, um, you really want to do your due diligence to help mitigate any risks 
and make sure that your decisions are informed uh, before you move forward on investment. Not not after, not three years down the road when you're trying to be a you're trying to switch from a passive investor to an active investor. Uh, all of a sudden, it's right up front when you first see that deal, and, and really. It's what helps you sleep at night. And so that's kind of when when I say due diligence, that's that's what I'm talking about. So, I, and I, you know, in the conversations I've had with investors, does due diligence actually mean the elimination of all risk? No, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, and, and, and the fact of the matter is, and, and actually we'll probably get into this a little bit later, there are... There are unforeseen risks. There's are there's foreseen risks across the board in all these pieces. What I think really it's trying to make sure that you're doing is is you one you understand all the foreseen risks, and two you understand how an operator or whoever is bringing you that investment how they handle some of the unforeseen risks. What's their plan that they put into process to do that? Because where you really I think where you see some of the the operators from the good from the bad is that someone will say, you know what, we don't honestly have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to be happening in five years with the market or with, you know, across the world. But we have a solid plan in place for any one of these types of risks and a team that actually can execute it on. And so one of the things that I always like asking when I'm looking at something is, you know, for myself first, understanding what I think the risks are, but then asking the operator what their risks are. And having them identify them and say, okay, what's the plan to mitigate those risks? Because in reality, you can't foresee every single risk, but you can make sure that you have the team in place and a plan that they're ready to execute on. Hmm. I like that. Uh, So, you know, just kind of moving forward, you know, forward, because I like people, you know, especially with this show, we're trying to kind of just have people understand and remember terminology. And that way we, in the boot camps, we can take them to the next level so they can actually like apply apply that information and learn to analyze and then evaluate off of it. So, you know, when we're talking about due diligence, right, it's just about a matter of like, kind of like, you know, understanding those things that you do know, but also kind of Mm -hmm. getting a glimpse into how the operator might handle the things that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. Why is this so important? I mean, you alluded to it. I mean, like, if you don't, it's better to do ask these questions now than later, but I, I know so many investors and I, I will say I'm guilty of this at the very beginning of my investing career going, hey, oh, yes. what are you investing in? Oh, great. oh I'm so excited. Let's see? jump in. Whatever. Yeah. Show me the next deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why is this so important to, you know, to really like learn, learn how to do this? So, uh, you know, it's it, first and foremost, I think, you know, you really, I mean, Everyone here that's looking to invest has hard-earned money, right? They've worked a majority of their lives to earn this money. Um, They are sacrificing things in their life to actually gain this type of money because obviously we're talking about credit investors and we're talking about PassiveInvesting.com. And so we know that, you know, probably the number one thing is you don't want to lose that principle that you've you've had, right? You want to actually retain the principle as well as appreciate and grow it from that perspective. So one of the key pieces in doing that is making sure that you understand the risk and that you work with an operator or an investment partner that really not only knows the risk that you're asking about, but then actually can say, and there's this risk and this risk, but here's how we're actually handling all those pieces. It really speaks to how mature and experienced that actual operator is so that you and yourself, you can actually make sure that you're retaining that principle and then gaining money on top of it. But Winnie, there's one thing like, before we get into all of those pieces, I just have to say this because I know we've talked about it and there's a lot of people that I talk to on the phone that just want to get into the deal, like you said. It's first making sure that you have an investment goal that you have actually yourself have thought through and planned. And that when you're saying, you know what, I'm either fixed income and therefore that should be part of my goal. I want a monthly distribution every month or you know what, I'm W2 and I'm just trying to create a nest egg. You know, having those investing goals in there is first very important because that'll help you actually align kind of, let's say your due diligence checklist. And I know we'll, we'll go into that in a little bit here, 
but it helps align kind of what you are going to be, how risk bearing you can be in certain types of investment as well as other pieces. I think the second piece too, the beginning of any types of before you start to look at investment, what's your timeline, right? Are you looking at something that you can give that principle that you've worked so hard for and put it in a deal for five to seven years and not necessarily say, I need that principle back actually in 30 days. You need to make sure that you have a good timeline and understanding with this principle. Hey, this is going to be that timeline for, for this money. Or you know what? I do. I need to sit, have this sit here for basically, let's say, three weeks, and then I need the cash back. That's going to help also drive you. And the last piece is actually the risk tolerance, which kind of comes into our initial uh, discussion. But you know, you might be at a different stage of your life if you're single uh, person, let's say working for a software company in California with no family in terms of what you can invest in versus let's say you're preparing for college and you've got four more years and okay, what am I going to do with this money and making sure that you're either retaining that principle in a little risk, less risky way versus, yeah, I can take some chances in the beginning and I can look at some deals that are going to be more risky. So before we even get into the due diligence, I think internally you could call it due diligence on yourself, right? You have to think through those pieces first, because then then when you actually get into your so-called due diligence checklist, if you will, that's going to help guide some of those decisions and some of those answers in order for you to actually come up with that ultimate answer of I'm going to invest with them or I'm not going to invest with them. Hmm, I love it. I love it. So I love giving people frameworks, if at all yeah. possible. So, um, you know, because it gives people a way to kind of think through like why they're doing what they're doing. I mean, any yeah. one of us can go online and Google due diligence checklist and probably get, you know, a hundred point checklist of yeah. questions to ask operators. But do you actually know what those questions are trying mm -hmm. to get at? So, um, you know, do you have a framework that we could share with um, investors? Okay. This is, awesome. this is trademark and shouldn't be repeated anywhere no i'm just kidding um so uh, super secret you guys super don't secret me, yeah please okay. don't All of please don't know. so okay. i so you know my list of due diligence items actually comes from let's say someone i borrowed from uh right that i'm facing right here whitney uh as well as just some <laughs> other general questions that are really hot topics so my main focus areas are about eight areas and i'll, I'll go into them so the first one is a financial analysis so I, I know, you know, no one really likes to get into Excel except for us quants, right? And understanding kind of what, how does a financial statement read? But really, you have to understand the details of the deal. You have to understand, you know, when someone shows you that offering memorandum and you see the trailing 12, you have to understand what that means, right? You have to see like, okay, I see revenues are pretty steady. Oh, oh my gosh, there's a 100% jump in the revenue the second year we own the property. Well, what is that about? Right. So you have to catch those certain pieces from a financial perspective to really then be able to ask those specific questions, because in some cases, and this is not at all right. In some cases, there could be some of those big jumps in there. And I'm not saying that that's not wrong or right. I'm just saying that the operator needs to be able to explain that to you in very simplistic terms to say, oh, yeah, that's why that jump is there. Or even on the expense side. Hey, yeah, expenses wise. We're reducing expenses because we're going to put in a, you know, a 40K monthly plan, but all of our categories are going to be less than $40,000. Well, if that's kind of makes sense to you and they have that plan clearly stated, that's really going to let you know about those financial pieces. The second piece that I, you, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, and for those of you who are kind of newer to the game, trailing 12 is really like, you know, when the operator gets the, hopefully gets expenses for the past 12 months or trailing 12 mm -hmm. months from the current owner, um, then, you know, then you can get to kind of like nitpick and look in there and say, oh, this is how we can optimize income or optimize the expenses. So that's what trailing 12 means. Um, secondly, market analysis. The, uh, I mean, in reality, when I look at places, I make my decisions and who I invest with and with the places I invest with, with an area that if it's a multifamily, where do I want to live? right? Where's somewhere where I want to do business that I want to go to a car wash or something like that. It's really understanding that, you know, the real estate market that that specific asset is in is actually making sense with what the actual operator is saying. So it's making sure that it's clear that yes, people want to live there or people are moving there from other states. I'm, I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, 
And the first time I went to South Carolina, I got, oh, not another person from Ohio. Well, you know, kind of hurt a little bit, but it makes me understand that, hey, there's a lot of people basically picking up their roots. And I'm in Illinois now, but moving to these locations that are pretty hot. And so that's driving the property values. That's driving, you know, some economic trends as well as, you know, job movement. It's really having an understanding about kind of what that market is, because in reality, even if let's say, and, and, and this is the one thing too, Whitney, that I wanted to point out, there's been a lot of press about what happens in a downturn and what happens with markets and everything. Just because something is national or even a world news doesn't necessarily mean that every single market is going to be down. Right. And so having a good understanding of actually the market of where this investment is going to be and the driving factors of that market, that's critical to understanding, actually, hey, I get what this market is doing. I understand what they're saying. And this still could hit with some of these risks that we don't anticipate, but still be a viable investment. Um, yeah. I'm gonna... and real estate's local, right? That's right. what you're trying to drive at. Like... Exactly. You know, what you might be seeing in your own backyard may not apply to other areas in the United States. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely true. And I it's interesting. I get a lot of conversations. Well, I saw this about the commercial real estate in the Wall Street Journal and love the Wall Street Journal. Read it every morning. I have I go back and forth with several investors about articles. Um, but in some cases, they're just talking about the general market. You know, you have to really focus in on, on what that market is. Um, thinking about kind of more to the team side of actually the operator themselves. And actually, I think we we, we have a, a checklist of eight red flags of an art operator. But one of the key pieces that I always like to look at is actually the team. Um, when when I'm evaluating a, an investment, I like to take a step back and say, okay, what is this? What does the team look like that's going to be managing this property? So obviously, you know, you want general partners and, you know, ideally would want one or excuse me, more than one general partner in that in that fashion. Um, but it's really about, you know, how dynamic are them? How experienced are them? Are they relying on one small team to do everything right? Thereby, that means to me like, well, <laughs> my K1 is going to be late. Um, I'm not going to be able to get, you know, questions answered, right? Do they have de dedicated teammates that are actually doing specific jobs uh, for the organization. So you have someone, you've got an acquisition team, right? You've got a finance team. You've got even an investor relations or, or services team that's there for the investors. So really having an understanding about them, what their experience level is and what their experience has been in this asset class is extremely important. And, you know, there are a lot of great people out there that are small and absolutely go get them. And, you know, I, I was, you know, thought I was going to create this empire of Airbnbs in uh, northern Michigan, or excuse me, south, southeast, southwestern Michigan. Um, we haven't grown it to that, right, in terms of what my sister and I are doing there. But when you look at spending that, you know, investing that money, really have a good understanding of what that team can do. I don't know, Whitney, if you've ever had experiences with that. Always oh, positive. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, um, here's how I put it, right? Is, you know, everybody has to start somewhere, and, mm -hmm. but, you know, there are people that are, you know, operators that never grow past the kind of more the joint venture stage. You know, the people that are really good are going to figure out ways to create leverage within their own business and, and, and focus so they can focus on what they do best. Mm -hmm. And so those mm -hmm. are the teams, you know, accredited investors, you guys have a choice of where you invest your money, right? Yeah. You know, you can pretty much go into any private placement asset. So that is, I love that you bring up team and not just about like operators track record and exit numbers and all that. I mean, those are important details, but really like how well can the operating team, you know, how are they built? Um, how is the workload distributed? How are they able to service the investor? I think that is you know completely critical because um, quite honestly, when you hit, you know, most of the time in real estate, you know, operators are placing property with property management, right? So a lot of, you know, they're partnering with the property management on day-to-day -day operations. And so they're just asset managing. But, you know, when the proverbial, you know, what hits the fan, <laughs> like, like, you need everybody on board and you don't need somebody wearing 10 hats in the business. You need people like in their, in their lane and, and working on behalf of the investor. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Because it's, I think people have been on this call. I work with, I, I invest with several different operators. I mean, not as many as let's say a Dan Hanford or a Danny Rendazzo or yourself, Whitney, but when I don't get an answer about something and it takes like a week and a half or a second email, you know, I don't, I'm not very happy about that. So anyway. Um, well, you get nervous too. Yeah, right? you do. And, and What's like, happening? What's happening? And, and, you know, the whole relationship with the operator, this is how I, how I look at it, you know, general partner, limited partner, we're partners, we're business partners. Mm -hmm. And so um, I want to be treated as such. Oh yeah, <laughs> and absolutely. You don't partner and hanging for weeks at a time or days at a time. But I have operators that I've invested with where, you know, um, you know, I have a couple of deals that aren't going that high, yep. but some of the operators, you know, email, you need to get a, you know, a status update and they're like on it, you yep. know, very head first into it. This is what we're doing. And then, you know, there's, you know, one or two operators that are like, you know, like you said, kind of crickets and that doesn't, Oh yeah. um, the first assumption is something's wrong. Yes. When I dig in, usually it's because that operator is wearing too many hats and they're staying focused on the business rather than getting back to me as the investor, which mm -hmm. I guess works. <laughs> you kind of want them to, to focus it on the business. It doesn't make me feel but, good though. <laughs> but yeah, no, I got you. I got you. But it's interesting. I mean, this kind of rolls into my next point. Um, so, you know, my, my next point basically is having a, a smart use of lending, right? And... Mm -hmm we'll talk about that just like in, in, in a minute here, but one of the key pieces that I know we've been contacted about a lot is like, okay, well, interest rates, what are they doing? Right. And I think now this is mm -hmm. a very hot topic outside of just being a fundamental of something to pay attention to, but it's extremely hot topic in terms of what, where we've seen rates. Right. And so when, when you talk about, uh, you know, a, a smart use of lending um, it's, it's really making sure and don't tell anyone I said this, but is fixed rate always the way to go? And I'll, let me caveat that for a second. Absolutely, I want to know how much I need to pay per month, and that would be fixed rate for 30 years. I love it. Let's do it all day long. However, when fixed rates are at like 10% or what you, know, what you could see, hopefully not coming up, but if you were to see like that, is fixed rate the right way to go? Or maybe it's really a, a, a more understandable way to use a variable rate. And so it's not saying that all variable rates are bad or that all fixed rates are good. It's about kind of understanding, okay, what in what type of a market would a variable rate make sense? Is it maybe more at the top of the market when you're seeing, and when I say top of the market, I mean saying that interest rates are really high. Maybe that's a good time to get a, a, an interest rate. Not knowing where, you know, where the rates are going to go actually, because we don't have a crystal ball, are you also utilizing a cap rate that actually then caps you at a certain interest rate, even if you're using a variable rate? So you don't exceed a certain number, but then you actually get the downslope on that. So it's having a good understanding of what that operator is doing with interest rates on the loans that they're taking out and making sure that you, know, you are staying open about, okay, yes, I only want fixed rate or I at least understand why they might be going with a variable rate, but how are they actually, you know, assessing that risk and how, what's their plan to actually go against it? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's, it's matching the business plan with the, the, the right lending structure. Right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have an asset, I mean, in my mind, like if you have an asset that you're going to hold on to for like 10, 15, 20 years, which by the way, most commercial lenders assume that you're going to sell the asset in five to 10 years. So those yeah. products, that's why those products generally don't exist, but let's pretend, you know, that you were planning on holding it for that long, you know, paying a higher fixed interest rate and then refinancing later might make sense. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for, you know, if the operators, and this is where it goes back to you understanding your goals, risk, and timeline. If you're looking to, you know, turn your money over, create that velocity of money as an investor mm -hmm. every five to seven years, then, you know, learning how to create, you know, use leverage wisely mm -hmm. and see, um, you know, it, it, you know, paying that extra money or those extra percentage points for a fixed rate probably doesn't make sense. Yep. Um, yep. Now, I'm curious, you know, um, you know, what are your thoughts, though, on an operator having to, you know, if they're going to have a variable interest rate, 
and they have the interest rate cap. You know, are there any additional kind of questions that you would kind of dig in a little bit more oh, yeah. to understand like is that really is safe or not? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think um, first and foremost, understanding the terms of the variable rate loan to say, okay, you know, what's the maturity on this? Um, you know, what type of extensions do we have? So a lot of them are set up. I think kind of the typical ones would be like if if, if people going into a, a variable rate loan, they're probably doing some type of bridge loan, right? And it's maybe two to three years until it actually then starts to amortize. And at that point, they can possibly go an extension. And I think in some cases, I mean, this is going to be different across the board, but extensions are offered. The first one is, you know, usually free. You don't have to pay anything to do that first extension. But where the cap rate actually comes out is people are only going to buy the cap rate for the, the uh, initial term of that two to three years. And so when technically that, let's say, variable rate kind of matures in itself on that loan, the cap rate finishes. And so then you have to understand, all right, what's our plan? Are we going to go into that extension on year one? And if that's the case, are we reserving additional money to buy another cap rate to last for that year? And so those are some more additional questions that you want to be asking as they actually talk through those pieces, as well as just their overall strategy on what that is. I think one key piece to in, in kind of getting back to just kind of smart use of lending, um, we know a lot of operators like to refinance. That's a great way to actually get capital out and return some, some cash to your investors. But make sure that's not really the only business driver when you're looking at, you know, people receiving cash or receiving, uh, you know, their principal back, that it's only because it's a refinance. I mean, I don't know. Well, I'm sure there's a, a lot of people out there that would knew, know exactly where we're going to be at this level. But how many people were actually sitting here two years ago and saying, yep, I'm going to put my money in. And then they could have forecasted that we were we would be at where we at. Um, not too many, I would say. Um, at least we weren't. I wasn't. Uh, I wish I was because then I'd, you know, be retired probably somewhere. Um, but it's just an important understanding to kind of think through that, understand, you know, the strategy and then understand really those specific items about the variable rates, the cap rates and, and how they're actually utilizing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you knew where we we're going to be right now, um, you know, I want to go with you to Vegas. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Just That's good. Kidding, guys. I am not a gambler. And you guys know me. I'm like, <laughs> I don't even do fantasy football. That's my husband. Uh, um, so okay. Um, so are there any other kind of areas of due yeah. diligence that mm -hmm. you know that you know maybe share a couple more and then we'll open it up to our um uh asking anything for those people who are here live. Absolutely. So another key piece that that you know, I, I think I had at the beginning um, was what's the exit strategy? You know, everyone shows and like, okay, here's our five year, seven year hold plan or whatever, whatever it is. And then, oh, we're going to sell. Well, who, who are you going to sell to? You know, have you done a full cycle deal? Do you understand what, what those types of organizations and those types of either REITs or institutional investors really want? And does that align actually with, with what they're looking for? Um, I think one of those, you know, blaring things that you see in some of these pieces and like, oh, yeah, and then we're going to exit and we're going to make all this money. But really having the connections and know how to understand what that next buyer wants and where that next buyer is, to me, is kind of a critical piece that when you're asking, a, you know, and evaluating a deal, yes, that strategy makes sense from an exit perspective, or even you don't necessarily have to have just one exit strategy. You could have, hey, this is our main objective, then here's our secondary objective. And if that doesn't work out, here's our tertiary objective. But it's making sure that they have that understanding and they can, you know, apply those learnings from either a full cycle deal or their knowledge of the market to make sure that they have that. There's uh, two other pieces that I also find, uh, at least for myself, very good. And I think we hit on one of them. It's one the communication with the operator. I think we talked about that. You, you really want to make sure, you know, I'm giving you my hard money. I, I would like to know what's going on, right? It, it, either through monthly updates or I'd like to see some financials or really kind of get on the phone with the operator to understand, let's say, the marketing plan 
in order to make sure that we're getting the occupancy higher. Some of those pieces I really want to understand. So I think there's a really good communication piece. Um, and the last piece that I would say is really understanding your taxes. Um, I actually just uh, wrote an article about this uh, in our newsletter. And a lot of people, common conversations that we're having these days is, well, you know, why am I giving, you know, you 100000 when I can go to, you know, treasuries and do 100000 And that's you know, great. It's a great conversation to have. But one of my questions that we go into about that is, OK, what's your tax is going to be like? So if you're going into a multifamily or a car wash or something like that, you could definitely take advantage of depreciation. And we can go into all the, you know, bonus depreciations, accelerated depreciations and things like that. But basically, the first couple of years, you might be showing you might not be actually you know claiming any gains on that. And it just be, could be taken care of the depreciation, whereas in a lot of these other cases, like treasury bill, that, that's income interest, and that's going to get taxed at, at your normal income standard. So it's really having that understanding of, you know, if you're thinking kind of long term, what's that tax implication for me? So all in all, these, these lists of really kind of seven or eight things, it's really to understand what's the risk that you're facing. And you could even throw risk in there actually as a number eight, if you, if you truly so wanted to. But it's really having that understanding about, you know, the risks that this operator is taking on, whether or not they understand it, whether or not they're explaining it well, and do they have a plan in place to answer those questions um, so that that's going to help you feel better um, and know that they are actually a true professional in this venue. Mm, I love it. I love it. And, you know, those are all great things. And this is the reason why, you know, um, I encourage people to, to not just take a, a due diligence checklist and like, make it your own, right? Because you you need to understand your goals, risk, and timeline. And that gives you a different lens on how you can look at somebody's big long list mm -hmm. of checklist and what areas are important to you to protect. Because you know, we just heard from Ron, for me, like I'm always looking at ways to preserve capital, create cash flow, the equity piece, tax benefits, right? Smart use of leverage, a couple of other different buckets, but that list, all of those a hundred point checklists, like I feel like you're taking your car to mechanic, right? Like a <laughs> hundred point inspection, right? Those all serve to answer your top four, five, six, seven, eight burning areas, yep. right? To, mm -hmm. to, to shore up your decision making process, right? Not eliminate all risks, but shore up that decision making process. Rob, I have one last question for you. If, what is the one thing that you want investors to take away from today's talk? I, I think right off the top of the list that you just outlined, Whitney, is really have a better understanding of what your goals are and your timeline and the risks that you're willing to take on. Because when you take a list of, let's say, these seven or eight or even that 100-point checklist, you could just be going through and checking them off. But in reality, if you don't truly understand why you're doing this, then it's just running through that checklist really isn't going to do much for you. And, and I think that that should answer, you know, starting off, especially if you're a new investor and you're so excited because you hear about people, you know, making, you know, different streams of income in multiple different places. That's great and can definitely get everyone excited about, but having kind of that understanding of who you are as a person, where you are, maybe an entity in itself of what you want out of that, what the goals you're trying to achieve. That's the most important thing. Awesome. Well, Rob, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us here today. If people want to uh, reach out to you directly, how could they do so? Yeah, you can email me. Very difficult. Rob at PassiveInvesting.com. Sorry. Just is, nice is, and is simple. That <laughs> R -O -B -B, R -O -B -B, just kidding. <laughs> R-O-B, just so we're clear. Yeah. Very awesome. difficult. Very difficult. You guys, you guys can't tell. We have a lot of fun together. Um, all right. Oh, <laughs> uh, guys, we're gonna cut the comedy act. Thank you so much for joining us today. Actually, no, we're not gonna cut it. We're just gonna push pause so we can actually make a clean exit of the show. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we look forward to um seeing you back on future master classes. And, and you know, most importantly, I always want I love thinking everybody, thank you for taking the time to invest in yourself. This is what we're here to do. This is what we do in the Passive Investing Made Simple Masterclass. Guys, take care.